Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I realized I was muted. Whoopsie, what a clown move. Funny enough, I actually unmuted myself a couple of minutes ago, so I'm not really sure what's going on here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, so starting over. Uh there there is no news, guys, about Mass Effect, but you know, we're we're keeping the ball rolling. We're we're doing uh we're doing Mass Effect Mondays as we should. I'm not gonna I'm gonna try my best not to skip out of them uh, out on them, but it's very easily like easy to uh not cover these Mondays because usually we're we really don't have anything new. But uh I was thinking that we're gonna check out at least uh you know, we're we're gonna like do this kind of thing where we sometimes react to other content from other creators like Big Dan and Kala, and then we're gonna move back to like me publishing a video. So we keep doing this thing where we're like going around, going around, just to keep the thing going, right? To keep the ball rolling. Uh you just hit Control Alt Delete. <laughs> sure. <laughs> How you guys doing, by the way? In case you're wondering what the hell this is. This is my cat. Uh, she is here all all the time, every goddamn day. I'm never left alone. She's always there. Uh, <laughs> so in case you're wondering, what this is this this is a ball of hair from a cat. Um, how'd you like Rebirth? So here's the thing, right? Before we start talking about Mass Effect, you might have seen me publish a video where I just want to kind of go over something with regards to Final Fantasy VII. I liked it. Um, I I actually kind of liked it, but there are things I don't like about the game. Uh, I'm not going to make a review of it probably because nobody really cares either way. I just released this video today because I felt like I needed to get it off my chest because there is, they 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 do a good job of things like pulling at your heartstrings and uh, telling a relatively okay or good story at parts and the characterization, especially surrounding Aerith, I think is really good. And so I've, I was, I, you know, I just, I need to get this off my chest. This is how, like, I, I see, th I see this because I know some people are interested in it. So yeah, that's why I released this uh, Final Fantasy video today. I know, like, a lot, most people weren't expecting anything when it comes to that, but you know, I, I gotta talk it a about it a little bit. Um, doing better now, nice, Jonathan. Justin, welcome, cat stream, nah. Like, if I bring her over here, my cat, like, my shirt is going to be all white. Uh, Kala, welcome. Welcome, welcome. I think we're going to check out a video of yours. The um, uh, Humanoid Studios, because I haven't checked out that one yet. So I really want to see that one. And we're also going to check out Big Dance uh, Andromeda review today. I really want to check that out. <laughs> These are the only times really I get to watch other creators stuff because otherwise I'm just busy with my own things. Uh, you should have a cat cam. Oh yeah, I should. I said that I, I, I would get a uh, dog cam a while ago, but <laughs> he's never in the room. It's always just the cat. Uh, I'm hyped for humanoid. Oh fuck yeah. So we have humanoid, we have the next mass effect and we have um, uh, Exodus. Right, so we have three sci-fi games, or well, four technically, because Mac Walters is working with his own little studio on making also a sci-fi game. So, like most of the OG, like a lot of the veterans, just split off from Bioware, and then we have like three new games from people who have worked on Mass Effect, which is so cool. It's just so insanely cool. It's like all of these feel like spiritual successors in a way, you know, because most of them have like worked on Mass Effect. Uh, FF16 is better than 7 Rebirth. I don't know about that, man. I don't know. Like, I, I think the story, um, you could say that 16 is a more original story because it's not a remake, but uh, I think I think they do a good job of several things in, in Rebirth. The voice acting, characterization, dialogue, I think is pretty mostly good. There are things I don't like about it, though. Um, Oh then, welcome to the Ensven squad again. Aren't you? Aren't you an old member? I would love to hear you, what you think about my Ensven agent theory too. At some point, okay, you decide. Which one do you want me to watch first? <laughs> I'm so happy that I'm I'm actually allowed to do these reaction streams, uh, for both like uh, Callus and Dance uh, videos. 
because usually I don't want to react stuff, react to things. Uh, what are your thoughts on Dune Awakening? I thought it was an RTS until the big reveal. I haven't really seen much of it. Uh, I've been mostly focused on wanting to see Dune 2, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. Squadron 42! I mean, Squad... Oh, is that even a game? <laughs> so far from finished, right? How's everyone? I'm doing well, Commander Shepard. Thank you for asking. Either, either you decide... Okay. I'll begin with the humanoid studio. We'll we'll, uh, we'll go around. I'm not a massive FF fan, to be honest. I feel that. I mean, I can see it on my analytics. Like most of you guys aren't interested in mass or in uh, in uh, in Final Fantasy, but uh, you know there are some of them that interest me. Um, I'm a big fanboy of FF14, so that's a thing. I would love to talk about it on the channel, but again, it's like you, I get no traction with those things, so. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta keep to whatever you guys watch. And then, you know, sometimes you can try to go out of your comfort zone with, with games like such as Baldur's Gate and games like uh, uh, Dragon's Dogma 2. So, well, like, we, you know, you can do that, but usually you gotta stay within your lane <laughs> because the, the, the YouTube algorithm will not like it whenever you go outside it. Um, Start playing uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic. You go ahead. You go ahead, Lahel. <laughs> Welcome to NATO. An appropriate comment, my friend. Horseman. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I haven't actually. Here's the thing, right? I don't pay much attention. I'm so I'm so in the zone on the gaming world that I'm not like I'm not even thinking about the huge world problems like that. <laughs> I guess you could congratulate Sweden, and I thank you. I thank um, thank you on behalf of Sweden <laughs> or something. I don't know. Uh, yo, Pays, how you doing? Funcom and offset, great and promising beginnings. Weak or no end game? Funcom. Uh, I'm a huge Final Fantasy fan. More Mr. Alton for me then. Nice. Well, at some point, I probably will talk more about it. I don't know. We'll have to see. It's got. It's got to work with the channel you know it's got to be worth worth the time and effort put into it uh warrior norman what's up how you doing welcome bronwyn oh wait is sweden in nato now yeah i realized that like yesterday <laughs> i was like oh headline that just you know popped in on my pc and i was like oh yeah okay uh-uh okay <laughs> and then i just moved on it's hard to focus on things like that when you're so immersed into the gaming world, which has its own like massive, you know, things happening in this sphere. So it's it's really Im impossible to keep up with everything that's happening. Dune Awakening devs. Oh, okay, so that's the thing. I see. I see. I'll check that out later. Uh, let's see if I can bring up uh, Big Dan Gaming. We're gonna check him out first. Oh my god. Uh, hopefully you guys don't get too pissed in case we have some Andromeda fans here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we gotta check this out. I've, uh, I've had this on my, on my list for like a week. Okay, filter. There we go. No, okay. Was that the wrong one? I think that was the wrong one. Pro streamer right here, guys. Yes, let's go. Boop. Nope, the screen isn't too big. Nope, it's not. Nice. You guys ready? You guys ready to get triggered? <laughs> uh oh, whoopsie. Racist Andromeda hand. <laughs> Again, guys, don't get too pissed. It's fine to have your own opinions. Uh, whether you love it or hate it, uh, it's it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> You're allowed to like and dislike things. Just as I dislike carrots, you're allowed to dislike apples or something. <laughs> I think it's fair in this review if I remember correctly. Okay, we'll see. 
Ah, Mass Effect Andromeda, the game we fans of the original trilogy like to pretend doesn't exist. Oof. How many games are there in the Mass Effect series? Why, there are three of them. Andromeda? Never heard of ya. It's almost <laughs> been seven years since oh the dumpster fire. <laughs> But he's right, though. Like, that is what a lot of the Mass Effect community really feels about Andromeda. Uh, it's it's like a, <laughs> it's like a lot of a lot of old fans just pretend like it doesn't exist. It's. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, KCJ, how you doing? Someone steal your Internet, bro? Uh, wait, what? Your YouTube is in white mode? No, this is on. Um... Uh, <laughs> this is on Chrome. I just want to keep the separate like uh, browser so I have my streaming window on the other one. Uh, Justin G with the 10 bucks. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Love your channel account. Don't ever stop. I'll, I'll make sure to never stop just for you. <laughs> I do uh, think a lot of people do feel like this. Yeah, I see a lot of it online. So it'll make ME5 interesting. Yeah. Out of, out of the gate, guns blazing. Gotta love him. Yeah. He has a tendency to trigger people, which is lovely because, you know, he's he's, try, he's trying to push your buttons. Fire release of Mass Effect Andromeda, and in the past few years, people have been rediscovering the game. In a similar way to AC Unity, Andromeda has seen at least a little bit of a boost in its reputation. Mostly so positive? wrong about this game? Damn. Is it actually a good game that's deserving of your time? That's what we're going to be diving into today. So here's the deal, man. I think Mass Effect Andromeda got a bad rap. It's not the worst game ever made no, or anything like no. that. However, that doesn't mean it's some kind of hidden gem masterpiece that you absolutely have to play. This does not mean the criticisms <laughs> that the game received at launch weren't valid either. The game was unfair. Here's the thing, though. Like, Donkey always clowns on, like, every game <laughs> whenever he makes videos. Uh, then again, you know, he was, you know... It was pretty harsh, as far as I remember. I think Pewds was also pretty harsh on it. <laughs> but uh, but he usually is when it comes to Donkey. Uh, with 4,300 4, hours of Andromeda played, I guess you could say I'm a fan. Well, that's fine. <laughs> it's better than Starfield? Killmonger, I actually agree. Yes, it is. I'm sorry, Starfield fans, but Andromeda is definitely better than Starfield because Andromeda at least has a pretty all right story. You know, if you just try to look aside from the scripts, uh, from a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the animation issues, and let's just look at the fact that like Starfield at times looks just as bad as Andromeda did sometimes, which is even worse when it comes to a game that came out last year finished and should have never been released in such a broken state. Bioware deserved to fail with this game. Damn! Holy shit. Okay, uh, let's put a, uh, do you mean Metro Exodus Cypher talking about from Russia? Uh, I don't know. What are we talking about? Metro Exodus? I'll tell you my gripe with the game. I'm stuck on 99% on everything. I've gone back so many times. Still can't get to 100. So you can say I'm, a, I'm vindictive. I see you're trying to get like the completionist thing. Okay, so you're stuck somewhere, but you don't know what. I see. Uh, way better gameplay overall. Yes, for sure. Like the combat in Andromeda is like if we come, if we put them like on a pedestal, Andromeda is like here and Starfield is like here. But then we have like the OG trilogy and they're like here. <laughs> now that all the bugs have been fixed, I think a lot of people will have fun with Andromeda. The game looks beautiful, and the combat and build variety is incredibly fun. So let's take a look at some of the positive qualities of Andromeda first, before getting into the things that no patch could save. Now, this is something that, uh, while well, we're speaking of Starfield, right? This is something that makes me wonder uh, whether the Steam... Um, reviews have gone up since the release of Starfield because that would make a lot of sense that people are like oh, I'm gonna give this other sci-fi game another shot and they start realizing that oh okay this is actually pretty fun compared to something like Starfield <laughs> so maybe that's one thing that has happened you know people have like realized that oh shit there's actually worse games that are newer <laughs> 
than a game that's this old now, right? And that's not saying that I didn't have fun with uh, Starfield. I definitely did. But yeah, I mean, uh, oof, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Later in the video, the biggest contribution Marks, that hey. Andromeda made to the franchise is a complete overhaul to the combat system. And many of the changes introduced in this game were a big W for Bioware. For starters, you are not locked into a rigid class choice for the entirety of the game. As you level up your character, you have the option to spend skill points in any category you like, allowing you to mix and match different skills and test different abilities. I played as an infiltrator or soldier for most of my time in the original trilogy, so there are a lot of biotic and tech abilities that I have hardly ever used. Andromeda was really my first foray into these skills, and I love testing out different playstyles as I continue to level up my character. Aside from build flexibility, Andromeda also introduced faster paced movement abilities for Rider. The jump jets, combined with various dash abilities, give Rider the opportunity to cover great distances with rapid speed. In uh, before we continue, uh, when it comes to builds and the varying classes here, so this uh, thing with Andromeda, it's like a double-edged sword. And I noticed that when I was playing through it, both on stream and, you know, privately later on for my video, that the builds, like, it's it's nice to be able to switch between them, but it also kind of ruins the uh, the replayability factor. Or, you know, it, it just feels like you don't really invest anything with your playthrough. And so you can just switch around however you want to another profile and use something else. And so it doesn't really feel like it loses that RPG-ness kind of so that I started missing when I was playing it. And so it is cool. Like, don't get me wrong. Had the story and the script and everything else been much better, then I would probably want them to have removed the uh, the flexibility of being able to swap profiles because then I would be much more interested in doing multiple playthroughs and even like having combat where I could just, you know, okay, I'm picking this class and I'm going with this class and I'm going to invest in it and learn how to play it. And then maybe, oh, I want to try out another class. And so you replay the game just to do that. Um, Starfield is soulless and has so much worlds, but it is empty. Starfield just feels like there wasn't much going on, even with its 1,000 hours of playtime so yeah like starfield is that game that's you know not really uh wide as an ocean deep as a puddle like that is something you can use for like when no man's sky was released that was essentially the same but no man's sky is much 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 better now and starfield however in comparison is pretty shallow at the end of the day and that is not only when it comes to gameplay aspects, but like the the story, the 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 progression, like most of the things when it comes to Starfield is very it's very wide, but it's not very deep. And Starfield does have potential pace, yes. Uh, they could definitely keep working on the game, make it even better and better and better and better. The question is if they're going to do that because they're probably wanting to start working on like the Elder Scrolls. They probably want to start working on a Fallout 5 as well or 6. Uh, so they want to, you know, or what is it? 5, 6? I don't remember. <laughs> so they could work on Starfield, but I, I'm not holding out my hopes that they will release a bunch of content for it. Modders will, though. In Mass Effect 1 and 2, we didn't even have a jump button. And in Mass Effect 3, the best we could do was a dodge roll. So this expanded move set in Andromeda is much appreciated. There is also more verticality in the level design with multi-story structures in many of the battle arenas. This gives you an opportunity to use the jump jets to scale and gain an advantage over your foes by taking the high ground. Or escaping quickly when a fight gets too hot. In the original trilogy, combat really took a backseat to the role-playing and storytelling aspects of the game. Indeed. The combat was fun and serviceable, but far from the best part of those games. But in Andromeda, the combat stands out to me as the best part of the experience. This yes. video is sponsored by Dragonair Silent oh, Jesus! Bomb, an open-world Western fantasy-themed strategy RPG that you definitely don't want to miss. Dragonair recently announced Phase Let's check two this out. Dra Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons. And Dragons and this phase features even greater rewards, richer game content, and upcoming events. 
With over 10 million downloads since God its global damn. launch last year, Dragonair has taken the RPG genre by storm with its rich tactical gameplay, dice rolls, character customization, dungeon battles, and exploration. After the iconic A mobile game, game. Drizzt and Urtu made their appearance in the game, Dragonair Silent Gods will officially launch Phase 2 of the Dungeons & Dragons collaboration on February 23rd. Two legendary mages, Elminster Omar and Samaster, will be making their debut. Players can take part in a new collaboration story, embarking on a quest with Elminster to tackle a major I mean... in Adenthia. You'll travel to the Cult of the Dragon Fortress to battle Samaster, the cult's leader and impersonator of the Child of Chaos. Dragonair is now available on Windows PC, Mac, Steam, and Epic Games, as well as both mobile platforms, Android and iOS. Click on my link in the description to download the game right now and join D&D Legends in Dragonair. Exploration. That actually looks relatively interesting. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not all for, like, mobile games. The only game that I've ever played on that is a mobile game, but on PC, is Genshin Impact and Honkai Star Rail. <laughs> but, you know, we got to make this work. We Like, this is, this is how Dan gets paid. I haven't done a sponsor yet. I probably will at some point, but I'm like still waiting for that golden opportunity where it's like really something that I really want to, you know, push on the channel, but I haven't found anything yet, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to get paid somehow, right? Um, getting ready to start a campaign with my buddy where I'm playing as an artificial ranger, Kobold. Oh, you mean on D&D? Uh, Starfield ha had or has potential, but it's just going to take a lot actual longer to time time to fix who knows they could have a cyber cyberpunk 2077 relaunch but it would take an iron will to sort it out definitely they would have to restructure so many things with starfield like the animations what are, what are they going to do there because it's just you know and none of the conversations are engaging because all of the npcs just look like robots um Mr. Holton, I've heard you say you wanted to be like Paragon Shepard and you have succeeded. You always managed to reduce my stress levels. That is very Paragon. Oh, you're welcome, Avian Blue. <laughs> That's good to know. I wonder how. This is my voice. Um, Procedural generation really let it down. The worlds have no reason to go on explore. That too. ...is another strong suit of Andromeda. Kind of. There's a honeymoon phase with the exploration in this game. Mm -hmm. The planets look gorgeous, owing to the excellent color renditions in the Frostbite engine. Mm -hmm. But after that initial wow factor wears off, you'll quickly realize that there's very little interesting content to discover on any of these worlds. True. Bioware took the Ubisoft slash Dragon Age Inquisition approach to quest content in Andromeda. The planets are filled to the brim with boring, forgettable fetch and kill quests that have no lasting impact on anything. I literally can't remember any of these quests specifically without going through my gameplay footage. And the gameplay loop of clearing vaults and checking things off a to-do list wears out its welcome very quickly. I'm an open world game junkie. I love these types of games and I've played pretty much every major open world action game or RPG that's come out since Skyrim. But Bioware just ain't on the cutting edge of this kind of game design. I think Bioware is at their best when they focus on creating a few small cities or zones for us to explore. This gives them more development resources to focus on what they are usually best at, creating compelling characters, stories, and meaningful choices for the player to explore. Mass Effect 2 is a prime example. I think, you know, in terms of of environments, uh, I think both Mass Effect 2 and 3 did it the best way where they organically created environments that was like they, they were there for a purpose, right? Uh, it wasn't just dropping you on a planet and just letting you go hog wild and look for things. And if, if we're going to be realistic, right, it's like with Starfield. If you are get, getting dropped on a planet, like you're, you're pro most probably not going to find anything interesting. It's just going to be a lot of wandering around, walking, seeing a bunch of mountains in the distance. I mean, that's cool for a while, but it wears off very quickly. And so what Bioware really should keep doing, as much as I love Mass Effect 1, I think Mass Effect 2, Mass Effect 3 are are the best when it comes to that you know where they have zones that you can actually explore a little bit but it's mostly like corridors in a way like it's 
it's not as open world as Andromeda or Mass Effect 1. So they definitely have better structure, I think, in both 2 and 3 when it comes to missions. Um, ME2 was the best for that. 3, you could only explore the Citadel and Sunset Strip at the end. Yes, ME2 is uh, slightly better there, yeah. Unfortunately, in this pursuit of quantity over quality, a lot of the story elements and character development end up suffering massively in Andromeda. And this starts with the main character, Ryder. Ryder is a terrible protagonist. The legacy of Let's Commander Shepard casts a long shadow on the Mass Effect franchise. And I don't envy the writers who were tasked with coming up with a new main character. But is this really the best they could do? Ryder is kind of a loser. He's insecure, cringy, unconfident, and no one respects him. He's regularly put down by authority figures True. from the Andromeda Initiative, and even his own squad mates will often walk out of the room when he's talking. Look, I can be cringy and insecure in my own time in real life. If I'm playing a video game, I want to be a Giga Chad, not some loser who nobody respects. <laughs> I can they try to make him more relatable, both... Uh, like both female, like Sarah and uh, Sarah and Scott are meant to be relatable characters. It's just it doesn't work because I don't want a relatable character in my um, in my futuristic sci-fi. Like the other characters can be relatable, sure, but the person I want to play is like the ultimate hero. That is what I want. That is it's the power fantasy, right? Uh, I get what they're trying to go for here, but it just didn't work. Uh, you just have a positive vibe. Nice. That's good to know. I should remember. I, sh I shall remember this or try to. <laughs> uh, the open world killed Andromeda and the character development was extremely bad. Um, sort of. Some would appreciate what the devs were trying to do with Ryder when compared to Commander Shepard. In the OG trilogy, the protagonist already had a ton of street cred and was well respected by the Alliance military. So we don't really get to experience as much character development with Shepard since the commander gained many of their accolades before the events of the first game. I mean, you saw that shot, right? That sweeping shot of seeing Shepard. It's just so different. It's it's just, you know, it's like, oh, you're following this hero through this corridor and it sweeps around and has this heroic music as it turns around and you see Shepard and you're like, damn, what a badass. And with Andromeda, it's like, oh, he wakes up and looks really funny. And it's just not really the same impact when you're introduced to the characters. It's like Shepard gets introduced with like a full on power move which sets the tone for what type of character Shepard is, but I don't know. Andromeda's, uh. uh. Do you think the movement to make characters intentionally ugly was in Mass Effect Andromeda? I don't know. I don't know. I think I've heard that before, but I think that's just an excuse, and I'm not sure if a, a developer has said this or if it's just people who say this. But I think it's just an excuse for how they were unable to make attractive characters in the Frostbite engine. I just think that they had difficulties with the engine. I don't think that they were uh, obvious, obviously trying to make unattractive characters. But if you just look at a lot of the NPCs, all of them just look so weird. They all look like clay, essentially. So uh, I think it's a, it's a mix between not having the time and not having... Uh, this the skills to work it out in frostbite because it was pushed on them in andromeda they tried to give us an origin story that charted Ryder's growth into a leader thrust into a position by pure nepotism and incompetence on the part of his dumbass father why couldn't you share the helmet by the way Ryder has to earn the respect of his peers and prove that he is capable of colonizing uncharted worlds and dealing with major threats through his deeds alone. But understanding this doesn't make it any more fun to play as Ryder, though. They could have told this story without having so many characters openly disrespect Ryder. Nobody asked for the Mass Effect Humiliation Fetish Edition, but Ryder aside, I will admit that Bioware did a decent job with the squad mates in Andromeda. They're no Normandy crew, but there are some interesting and likable characters in this game. Except for Liam, but we don't talk about Liam. My favorites were Drac, Vetra, Korra, Jal, and maybe PB. Still can't decide whether she's more cool or annoying. 
this crew still isn't as good as the OG trilogy squad. I kind of like PB, but then again, I have a thing for Asari, so that's probably why. Mates, but to be fair, many of those characters have the benefit of two to three games of development. If we were to judge characters like Tally or Garrus on Mass Effect 1 alone, they wouldn't be nearly as liked because a lot of their best moments happen in 2 or 3 Very true. as their relationship with Shepard deepens. Andromeda has some moments that remind me of the old Bioware. My favorite moment in the game was the movie night that you have with your crew. It captured a vibe similar to the Citadel DLC for me. But most of these moments are a flash in the pan, buried in an experience that is overall pretty lackluster. But where Andromeda really starts to lose me is how they handled choice and consequence in the story. Yep. I'm not going to rehash the whole story in this video, but there will be some spoilers in this section. Choice and consequence has always been a big part of RPGs, especially the Mass Effect trilogy. Part of the reason especially. this series is named Mass Effect is that the player is presented with big choices that could have a massive effect on the galaxy. <laughs> Get it? <sighs> I never thought about that before, honest to God. I never ever thought about that before, that the, the name Mass Effect is sort of like symbolizing the massive choices you make. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case though. I think that might just be a coincidence. The Mass Effect is just, you know, it it it's just supposed to describe the effect on mass that ele element zero has when you charge it with an electrical current but <laughs> i can see if that is also the kind of case it's a real knee slapper ha 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 yes because <laughs> it is true it is true at mass effect on a loading screen in mass effect andromeda you will see a message that says, Riders' decisions can have lasting consequences. Choose carefully. That we never see. Sadly, this really isn't the case. Most choices you will be presented with in Andromeda have no lasting impact on anything. In the main quest, Hunting the Archon, you need to choose whether to save the Krogan Scouts or the Salarian Pathfinder. If you save the Scouts, then the Pathfinder dies, and she is replaced with another Salarian NPC. Director Tan expresses disappointment at your choice, but then moves on. Instead, if you save the Salarian Pathfinder, then the scouts die, and Drac is mad at you for a while, but he eventually gets over it. In the end, the game is the same regardless of which outcome you choose. When you place your first outpost on Eos, you're asked whether to make the focus military or scientific. This is presented as a really big deal that will speak volumes Nothing about happens. the intentions of the initiative. But in the end, it doesn't matter whether you choose military or scientific because it only changes a few lines of dialogue, nothing else. Either way, you'll still have a group of NPCs protesting against you on the Nexus because their family members are still- That carrot top though, Jesus. <laughs> um... The name is a triple entendre. If it, it, it's the effect on mass, the mass effect it has on the play and the mass of the name. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, the eyes look really strange. Uh, the stance, the shoulders. I mean, look at this. Look at this guy. Like, who stands like this? <laughs> that's like, that's a shrug you do at the gym. And even then, his shoulders are like displaced. Same with her. Uh... So I mean, it's I think it's fine to criticize things like these because it was like it, it was still during a time period where a lot of good games with a lot of great graphics came out, and then this came out, and I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> still in cryo because you chose to place a military outpost or a scientific outpost. It's even the exact same group of NPCs protesting regardless of your choice. So I guess the guy leading the protest must have had a military daughter while Gam Gam worked in the bio lab. Ready for You're a fight! Either way, <laughs> on Kadara, you can either save Sloan Kelly and keep her in power, or let Reyes kill her and put him in power instead. Either way, you get a new outpost on Kadara, so it just comes down to which character you like better or dislike less. The only decision that had any real impact was your choice about the Remnant Drive Core on Elodin. 
If you keep the Drive Corps, you don't gain the Krogan as allies, and you can't put an outpost on Elodin. Whereas if you give the Drive to Morda, you gain Krogan support and a new outpost. But even that isn't really a big deal, because what do the outposts really give you aside from maybe one or two fetch quests, a couple of prefab buildings, and some generic NPCs, most of whom you can't speak to anyway? It's possible that Bioware had future plans for some of these decisions, like your selection of the ambassador at the end of the game, True. to have more meaningful impact on the sequel. Yeah. But seven years later, we... St I think it's it was meant to be, you know, a, a choice that you wouldn't see the immediate consequences of. It was supposed to be something you s saw in the sequel, which we never got. So, yeah. Too low, can't hear the mid. You can't. You cannot? How dare you suggest? I'm going to increase it a little bit because I don't want it to overpower my voice. Still don't have a sequel to this game, and we might never get a continuation of the Andromeda plotline. So I'm judging the game for what it is, not what it hypothetically could have been in someone's fever dream. If Bioware wants to Good win point. back fans to the Mass Effect franchise, they need to reintroduce meaningful story choices in the next game. It's a core part of the franchise that sets it apart from many other RPGs. Mass Effect is one of the only franchises where your choices can have an impact on the story in subsequent games. So at the end of the day, Mass Effect Andromeda... There are... there are other games that, that do that, though. We have, of course, Dragon Age as an example. Um, Deus Ex, if I remember correctly. Uh, I think that, yeah, there are several games that do that. So it's it's not like Mass Effect is the only franchise that does it, but I think Mass Effect is special because it does it to the to the scale that it does. You know, all the cinematic cutscenes and stuff like that, hap that happens when you do a certain thing that doesn't happen if you do another certain thing in the previous game. So... And, and they showcase it in these big, spectacular, massive ways. And you don't just don't really see it to the scale in other games. Uh, so, yeah, that is why I like generally think that Mass Effect is so memorable because they do it s to such a huge extent. Uh, is a halfway decent game with fun combat and exploration. However, it's a major step down from the original trilogy and lost the plot on what Mass Effect was really about. Role-playing as a powerful, respected soldier, making galaxy-shaking choices with your homies. If you're a fan of the Mass Effect series, then it's Good worth way to, it describe to check it. out Andromeda if you have the time. I would recommend waiting to pick up the game when it's on sale, though, because it sure as hell ain't worth $40. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe. Is it $40 now? I hope it isn't. Because it definitely shouldn't be. Let me check. Steam, Mass Effect, Andromeda. It is! It fucking is! And you can only buy it as a deluxe edition. I think. Let me check. Mass Effect franchise. Mass Effect. Oh my god. Mass Effect Andromeda. Mass Effect. Okay, so, so on Steam, you literally have to buy it as a deluxe edition for 40 bucks. <laughs> oh my god. What is this? Like, Legendary Edition, I can sort of see the 60 bucks. It should really, though, be uh, like 40 uh, at this point. What? It's been like three years. Damn. It's on sale all the time? Uh, okay. I, I haven't checked, but yeah, it, it isn't on sale now. But I haven't looked at the prices there. I was like, oh, what? Really? Yeah, okay. So wait when it's on sale. That's when it's worth it. Uh... But then again, you know, it's 40 bucks. 40 bucks really isn't too bad, but yeah, I can see why some people would stay off, you know, when when you just work a normal job. Uh, that's too much. <laughs> yeah. But if they have sales all the time, then it's probably not a not an issue. But uh they should they should just lower the price to like 20 bucks. I think 20 bucks is fine 
um and just have it at that at all times to big dan gaming for more mass effect and rpg videos. right don't forget guys check out the video to make sure you support the original creator so i'm gonna put this in the chat make sure you watch it later um got a hard, hard copy for five bucks damn I think I bought the game with the for the original price back back in the day. So yeah, but you know, uh, back then I didn't feel like I lost out on anything with with uh, Andromeda. I actually kind of liked it. So yeah, I see what he's saying though. So yeah, I don't have any issue with what Dan is saying here. Like most of it, like the information he he's talking about is correct. And uh, I've I've roasted it a little bit in my own video. <laughs> I try to be nice, but. You know, uh, EA stopped me from playing massive games any longer because they killed Origin. I despise EA more than I can say on here. Damn. Yeah, they changed it to EA, just, you know, regular old EA, an EA app. Uh, Suicide Squad is 40% off now, right now. That's bad. That's, that's pretty bad, as you know, because it released recently. Uh, let's check out Kala's video. Now we're gonna look at something relatively. Now I still call this, you know, something that is something to do with Mass Effect because, of course, we're both originally Mass Effect YouTubers. This is from Casey Hudson, the guy who literally created Mass Effect. Sort of. He was the top dog. Um. So yeah, let's check out what she what she has to say. Maybe there's something new in here that I didn't know. Let's go. Back in June of 2021, Casey Hudson, one of the founding fathers of Mass Effect, announced he has started his own studio, Humanoid Origins, just six months after leaving Bioware. He announced the studio had changed its name from Humanoid Studios to Humanoid Origin, saying that in a world of AI-generated content, the creativity of our games originates with the talented humans on our team. And he also revealed some teasers for their upcoming new game. Additionally, in an interview from January, he spoke about their upcoming game and the importance of player experience, choice, and agency. Yeah, yeah, we're still being a little bit coy, a little secretive about what we're doing, but certainly there are just aspects to the kinds of games that I've made and just the way that I like providing experiences for players that require a certain scale. The scale isn't the point, but the, there are experiential aspects about being able to decide where you want to go. Having really great characters, but the reason that you care about the characters is because you actually get to interact with them and develop relationships, which also there's a required agency and choice involved in that. And I love to create huge universes for people to feel like they're immersed in and can explore. And it, it's the universe revealing its story to you over time that that's i think part of the the dna of that kind of experience which is important too so all of these things kind of have a certain scope required of them and then for those reasons that's kind of why we continue to be ambitious in what we're trying to build but it's all in this, in service of these things that i think are really important in what i love to play in a game and also then the kind of experience that i want to provide for people well, ultimately, a dialogue system is really a means of interacting with characters. And when you look at the games that I've worked on from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic to Mass Effect 1 and 2 and 3, at each time, it felt like we were making something that was, I don't know, known or expected in some way. But what was happening was there was an evolution going on there. And so I think what people ideally will sense is there is continuity of the expectations that you're going to be able to decide where you want to go and you're going to meet amazing characters and develop relationships with them and have these kinds of interaction systems you know whether it's dialogue or otherwise but then to innovate eat. pause in case you guys are wondering like who the hell is talking that's obviously not Kala that's Casey Hudson so again Casey Hudson is the founding father of Mass Effect essentially if you really put it you know you know if you really <laughs> go from a baseline that is what he is so this is him talking. This is very interesting because I haven't heard this one at all. I wonder 
it's me using a voice changer. Oh, okay, it's just Kala pretending. No, it's this is this is has to be Casey each time. So that's certainly what we're looking to do here is thinking about what is the next version of the way we can interact with characters. He also talks about some Mass Effect stuff in this podcast as well. Oh, so and poem podcast. Okay, interesting. I have to check that out later. Hmm. Check out the link below. I gotta, I gotta talk to Casey. I really want to make it like, I, I would love to do an interview with Casey and just publish it on the channel where we're just shooting shit. That would be fun. That would be cool. Uh, I know that he has interacted with some of my content before. Not really sure how, but I know that he's been liking some of my comments and stuff like that. So I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if that would be possible. That could be fun. Oh, but everything he said here sounds really- uh, Slim, my dad called. What did I miss? Dan sounds really feminine now. Yes. <laughs> watching uh, Kala's video. ...promising. We know Hudson has been at the center of innovation and originality with his involvement in the creation of Mass Effect, so it'll be interesting to see what he does with Humanoid. And Humanoid is currently working on a multi-platform AAA title. Here we go. Our mission delivering magical interactive storytelling by connecting talented creatives to powerful tools in a safe and supportive environment. Current project is a multi-platform AAA game <laughs> focusing on character-driven narrative in an all-new science fiction universe. Honestly, the, they don't even have to um they don't even have to like market it as a AAA game. They could just go with we're making a future sci-fi RPG from, you know, some of the people that worked on Mass Effect. Ta da I think that's enough um to sell it. Just triple A, not the quadruple A like uh, Ubisoft. <laughs> Indeed, just a triple A. Focusing on character driven narrative in an all new science fiction universe. And I hate to compare everything Casey Hudson does to Mass Effect, but it's also kind of inevitable. Yeah. Considering he was one of the major creators that really came up with the idea in itself to even create Mass Effect. Yes. So with him now working to create a similar concept, it'll be interesting to see what he does after spending so many years on Mass Effect. And also with him now being unburdened by overhead from a parent company calling the shots. It's very nice also to hear like when he heard him talk before that he's very, 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 uh, um, he's very interested in scale, right? that to make a, a universe really appealing and interesting, having some form of massive scale can help a lot to make it, um, to, to make it really special. And we see that especially with Mass Effect, right? We see that with, with a lot of cinematic shots, like the Citadel, we have the Reapers, just the Normandy itself. There are so many things that tell of scale, and I think they do that so well in Mass Effect 3. Uh, like, uh, if you have, uh, what is it called? Megalophobia. Mass Effect 3 is going to scare the shit out of anyone who has that. <laughs> so uh, I, I love that idea. I don't know if that's what he meant, but it sounded like he meant that that's an important part, like making it a large scale universe. Considering this is his own studio. And I think Humanoid has made it pretty clear that there won't be any hindering of any of their devs. In an interview with Cordy Reerson, Humanoid's chief operation officer from back in 2022, she said Humanoid Studios was founded on the axiom that creative freedom and independence lead to better, more innovative games. Here we see, Our tell us more about Humanoid Studios. Humanoid Studios was founded on the axiom that creative freedom and independence lead to better, more innovative games. Our vision is that the future of entertainment is interactive. Most engaging entertainment involves worlds, characters, storytelling, innovation with tools and technology, unlocks interactivity that feels magical and people do their best creative work when they feel safe and supported. This is the old uh, webpage, I think. Uh, Casey Hudson is our founder. I met Casey while working at Microsoft and we worked on several initiatives together for Xbox and Microsoft 
HoloLens. He, was, he has created franchises like Mass Effect and he was ready to set out on his own. It was a no-brainer to join him. We share a lot of the same values when it comes to building teams and projects. I'm very happy to be working with him again and building a whole new experience based on our shared beliefs. Nice. Our vision is that the future of entertainment is interactive. Oh, and Caligo's reading The it. most engaging <laughs> entertainment involves worlds, Sorry, characters, and storytelling. Innovation with tools and technology unlocks interactivity that feels magical. And people do their best creative work when they feel safe and supported. It's very clear from the website that creative freedom is extremely important. Their mission is delivering magical interactive storytelling by connecting talented creatives to powerful tools in a safe and supportive environment. And their foundation really seems to be built on this, empowering creative talented people. The similar sentiment is seen all around their site. And like Hudson stated on his Twitter, in a world of AI generated content, AKA garbage, it's important to focus on human creativity. So I'm very excited to see what this looks like and how this manifests in their new game. The concept art that they've released is really beautiful, and it's very clear they're establishing their own vision and style. I and wonder what this game is going to turn out to be like when you supposedly have this much creative freedom just as a regular, uh, you know, just a regular developer. Uh, I wonder what type of game we're going to be in for here. Now, oh, obviously, there's going to have to be someone who like Casey controls the overall narrative or some like uh main writer or lead writer uh um someone at the top who essentially like makes sure that everything fits and works but I wonder like can they work in a very unified fashion by having that much creative freedom like I'm having a bit a little bit of trouble to kind of understand how that works um any news? No, not from Mass Effect. No, no, no. Our art director is the amazing Isaac Moody. He has some really amazing futuristic stuff up on his art station and was behind a few of the images revealed when Humanoid was announced. Another one of their concept artists is Bill Zhang, who has some really interesting environmental work Gears. on his portfolio. God damn. And we have Christopher Cow, who is a character artist and also did some work on Andromeda. And Andromeda's armors were one of its strong aspects. I really love the designs, so I'm excited to see him working on Humanoid. Yeah, he's just a and character artist. And the last artist. two concept artists that I could find were Alexandra Troth and Bahao Wang, which are also helping to bring... Hum see, the art uh, behind Andromeda was not its problem. The art in itself is really good when you check it out. But uh, it's just the uh, overall development for the rest of the game. Robotech? Humanoids work to life. So there's some really amazing artists behind Humanoid. Nice. And the artwork that they've shown so far is enough to get me excited about this new sci-fi project. So let's look at some of it. Obviously, this is all early concepts, so these probably won't amount to much. But there's that some was the really first interesting one. things in them. This, this was the first shot on the on the on the uh, website, and uh, I think this has. This has got to have some meaning since it was like literally the landing page for the website. So there's probably something going on with like giant aliens and I love it. <laughs> Please let this be an idea that they continue with because this concept art just looks so cool. It just looks so badass. Like imagine this being an alien. It's like it's head is literally the size of I don't know what, like the dome in Las Vegas or whatever. I just love scale like this. And this kind of goes back to what Casey said before about scale, right? This first image, which is the first image you see when you go to their site, is probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. It's very clear they're exploring some kind of alien ruins. And this piece looks like a massive alien skull. Whatever it is, it's really beautiful. And if it's the first thing we're supposed to see when it relates to their new concept of their new game, I'm all in. This next piece we have explores maybe gathering materials or something else from this planet transporting it. And I really love the ominous kind of spooky vibe. This next piece is really interesting because it's very futuristic. 
The sleek Mystery. designs and sharp edges in contrast to the very circular ship hovering over the water remind me of Ralph McQuarrie and Sid Mead, whose work was both major inspirations for Star Wars. And in this piece, we see again some more futuristic, but also kind of modern looking communal area. It looks like a cafe or a bar, but this really reminds me of how people in the 70s and 80s expected today to look like. Yeah. This very sleek, futuristic style. We also see another piece of concept art that looks like a restaurant or a bar with huge open windows where you can see ships flying above. And I really love this visual. So far, they're doing a good job of conveying the futuristic style while also adding their own spin on it. This additional picture looks like a dev is working on some concept art of specimens or plants in some kind of capsules. I wonder and because there's a lot of uh, like exploration slash, uh, I guess, research being done here. So I wonder if a lot of the game is going to be like researching things and trying to figure out like a mystery through collecting various like information from different planets. And so it might have something to do with that giant skull mystery. Uh, that could be a cool gameplay aspect, actually. The thumbnail, though? Yeah, the thumbnail. And this next picture is some kind of tropical cityscape. We see a city in the background with some very high-rise buildings and a very active nightlife. Another image here has some really interesting curvatures to the buildings and honestly kind of reminds me of Starfield. But I really love the a little bright bit. colors being used. And also we have this other image, which looks like something in a weird alien looking capsule. Definitely doesn't look human made. Evil aliens. And my favorite piece is this woman in a spacesuit and helmet. And I actually love that the helmet is just what looks like a regular fishbowl. Yeah. <laughs> you can see everything inside and outside. It's just some I glass. I also really love the sleekness of the suit. Just a really pretty atmospheric shot. Space, how you doing? Obviously these are all early concepts. So it'll be interesting to see how the game and concept evolves and come back and look at these when we finally learn more about their game. It's still very much in the early phases of development and they're still hiring, but they've got some pretty good names on their roster already, some of which Bioware fans are probably familiar with. So let's look at some of the employees currently at Humanoid. Let's go. Many of which previously worked at Bioware. There are some pretty big names in here probably the biggest being Caroline Livingston, who left Bioware to join Hudson over at Humanoid. She's the performance director at Humanoid, but was previously the voiceover and mocap director slash producer. She was right. behind Commander Shepard and the amazing voice acting of many iconic Dragon Age and Mass Effect games. If you've watched any of the Mass Effect cast reunions of N7 Day, she used to be a part of those and her passion and talent was really, really apparent. I'm sad she won't be involved in the next Mass Effect game, but I'm excited to see what she does over at Humanoid. Nice. Another familiar name is Nick Thornborough, who created some of the most iconic visuals in the Dragon Age franchise. He's an amazing artist. Damn. And he had been at Bioware for 15 years. And he also left Bioware to join Humanoid. That's a very iconic art. A little over arts. a year ago and is currently their cinematic lead. And Paul Dutton is the creative director at Humanoid Origin, and he worked at Bioware for six years and has been at Humanoid since November of 2021. He was the director of animation and cinematography for Dragon Age. And Dragon Age has some pretty amazing cinematics. So it's exciting to see him working on Humanoid's new title. Cool. Melanie Faulkner is, is also Humanoid's principal lead producer, having previously been at Bioware for over 11 years. She was a producer on Legendary Edition and multiple Mass Effect and Dragon Age games. She also left Bioware to join Hudson. Nice. Amanda Klesko is also over at Humanoid and was previously at Bioware for six years. She is currently Humanoid's narrative producer after working on Mass Effect 5 for about a year. So Humanoid... You don't say. So she worked... So one of the developers here worked on the next Mass Effect game for a year and then jumped over to Casey Hudson. Interesting. This is very interesting. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. 
if they're going to bring in some some elements maybe who knows who knows you know of course because but th like these are more people than i remember uh looking up back then when i made my video was it like last year or the year before that but uh, yeah wow okay there there's even more bioware developers than i thought there was that's pretty cool that's nice its new game must be pretty exciting to leave mass effect 5 for it and there's more ex bioware devs that are more on the qa and technical side of the development team and i'm only bringing up their connections to bioware because a lot of these people previously worked with Casey Hudson at BioWare, and it's clear they moved over for a reason. And while there isn't a ton of information out right now about Humanoid, their lead writer is Tony Elias, who worked on Middle Earth, Shadow of War, and Wonder Woman before moving to Humanoid in 2022. Hmm. And another one of their writers is J.S. Dews, who is a successful sci-fi author and she even shared some additional humanoid concept art up on her blog. In an interview from last year, she said she liked Mass Effect because of how much it devastated her. So I expect True. some heartache coming in Humanoid's upcoming game as well. God damn. I genuinely think Humanoid definitely sounds like it could be a major contender for future RPGs that have a similar focus like Bioware does. Uh, it's kind of scary seeing Bioware devs leaving ME5 mid-development. The the thing is, though, right, I think we can all, like, assume that it's probably still relatively chaotic, not chaotic, but it's probably pretty strict when it comes to EA, uh, or maybe the leadership at Bioware in general is still like it has been the past years. Now, I had nev I've not worked there, so I wouldn't know, but... It could also be that she simply wasn't needed more uh, really for her role for the next Mass Effect. And uh, it's possible that she just felt like, or maybe she just, you know, wanted to move locations. You don't really know. But uh, as far as I know, there's not that many people that have left the project uh, for the next Mass Effect, that is. I I would say that it, it could be pretty reasonable to say that, ah, oh, it's probably for some, you know, pretty normal reason that she switched jobs then again you know casey hudson is very famous for having been like the godfather of mass effect so it could also be that she had a chance and she took it so i mean i i would i would assume that that could be a case as well that you know of course you know if he has a job opening and the job opening is the job that you're good at then yeah i mean sure um Plus, isn't ME5 still in pre-production? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, it is. It is. If it's scary for Mass Effect, it's terrifying for Dragon Age. It, it's been pretty scary for Dragon Age for a while. Uh, I, I think most people are a little, you know, uh, we'll see when it comes to Dragon Age. But with regards to Mass Effect, it's it's mostly a different team. Uh, a lot of the people who do work on Mass Effect have moved over to finish off dreadwolf like to help finish it off but then they're gonna go back again to like you know work on mass effect so you know uh zeb how you doing i'm doing well thank you for asking specifically on player choice and agency and a heavy character driven story so it will be interesting to see what this means going forward we've already seen a shift from Baldur's gate 3 with more people wanting these type of games and I hope Indeed. Humanoid's project can have an impact on the industry as well. Competition is a good thing, and more RPGs for players are even better. Sci-fi so, RPGs. So yes, I'm very excited to see what Humanoid comes up with, and I love to see such a focus on uplifting and centering their creative devs. And also very excited to see more sci-fi games. Between this, Exodus, and Mass Effect 5, the future of sci-fi games is bright. And I'm especially excited to see what Humanoid does with their narrative team and art team, considering the actual team behind this project is so solid. Yeah, so but I think that we're going to see many, many more uh, sci-fi RPG titles in the future, because as we've seen here, these are just a few that, that, that have started very recently, mind you. So, man, like... What, 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 yeah, we have four games really 
from four different studios that are all working on a sci-fi RPG in the vein of Mass Effect. Like, I think we're going to see much more coming up as well. Like, these are not the only ones upcoming. There are definitely others that are being worked on. Probably other uh, Biover de developers that want to work on, you know, or do start their own projects. It's uh, yeah, it's uh, Bioware has some massive competition, and they're gonna have some massive competition, especially when you have like companies like Humanoid Origin here, like really selling the idea that hey, if you're a developer, come to us. We're gonna make sure to ca take care of you. We're not owned by a publisher. We're gonna make sure that you have creative freedom. We're not gonna stress you. We're not gonna, you know. Uh, we're, we're, we're not going to, we're going to do our best to make sure that you're comfortable at the, at your job. So it's like, whoa, okay. I mean, okay. And it's led by a guy that's very, very known, uh, in the industry. So yeah, I don't know. And Mac Wilder studio isn't making an RPG. He said it's more of a de defined narrative like the last of us. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. But it's still a sci-fi game. So I guess let's just say sci-fi sci games instead, because a lot of people just want sci-fi games. Humanoid was only founded in 2021, so I don't expect a release from them for a while. Maybe Probably not. 2026, 2027 at the earliest. So it will be interesting to see where they end up release wise. Between Probably this, 2028. Exodus and Mass Effect 5, I expect Exodus soon, within a year. Humanoid a few years after that, and then Mass Effect 5. Yes. So sci-fi RPG fans will have a stream of consistent games to look forward to, hopefully. But if you're interested in their future content, make sure to subscribe to see any and all news around all of these upcoming sci-fi titles. Good on you, Kala. Let me know what you think of Humanoid's mission statement and concept art in the comments. And thank you for watching. Nice. Good shit. I'm going to copy paste the link here. Remember to check out the video, guys. Yeah, that's a little bit more than I actually knew about last time. So yeah, there's more Bioware devs. Uh, that that uh, podcast I hadn't heard with Casey talking about like what his vision is, which is also really cool. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited for this. Now, as much as we don't really know anything about the game other than there's some sort of mystery seemingly going on here with those big alien skulls, but man. Uh, Hannah, I'm just wondering if Bioware is going to die out in the near future. I hope not. I hope not. I think they, I, I hope they can get their, their affairs in order and release a good game with Dragon Age for Dreadwolf. Uh, and then with the next Mass Effect game, like they could very much like rise from the ashes, but it will take a lot of effort and it will take a lot of goodwill, I think from the community and the fandom. Um, but even still, like even if they make two very good games, it's not gonna matter because it's gonna sell like hotcakes, right? Uh, because we had Baldur's Gate 3 last year, and let's say that we have Dragon's Dogma 2, now that's successful. That's also a sort of fantasy game. And then let's say that they released Dragon Age 4 this year, like later on, maybe like somewhere in maybe November or October or something. And it's a hit. I mean, then it's fine, you know, then then Bioware's future is secured. Uh, but it's it's got to be a hit. And uh, I, I'm not sure like what's going to happen if it isn't. I, I'm not sure. Like, I, I hope things go well. Uh, but uh, yeah. I mean, I, I always imagined Mass Effect being their golden goose at the end of the day. It's like, oh, okay, so if they lose out on Dragon Age, uh, then then Mass Effect is their last shot. And I really hope they can turn the boat around. Uh, Elias, welcome, man. How you doing? Um, they need to become an independent company. The problem with Bioware, I think, is that I don't think that they can afford it. I don't think they have the money to. Um, really, I, I, I don't know, but I, I don't see how, because they haven't made a game in so many years now that's sold really well. Their best seller is most likely still Dragon Age Inquisition because people still play them like 
especially if you check out like YouTube videos, you can see that YouTube videos regarding Dragon Age Inquisition are still relatively popular when it comes to like, oh, should I play it? Uh, it's still one of my most watched videos. It's just, you know, a review of Dragon Age Inquisition. And it's still relatively popular. Um, KOTOR, I'm excited about the new game by the former Bioware devs, but I'm very skeptic skeptical about anything coming from Bioware. Uh, here's the thing, right? I I I completely understand that. I um I'm I'm not gonna say that you're being unreasonable for feeling that way. Because as I mentioned, we we haven't gotten a, a really good game from them in, in a very long time. And um I mean games like Anthem had its charms, but it's it it obviously didn't go anywhere. They should have shut it down because it it just didn't sell. <laughs> there was no future for the game. And uh, Andromeda didn't get a sequel, didn't get any further work on it, and was essentially just also shut down uh, any like future work on it and, and stuff. So yeah, it's it's really. When you really think about it, it's really tough to see a future where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, Bioware can just leave, <laughs> you know, buy themselves out. I don't think they have the capital to do that. I just, you know, I don't know. Um, Hopefully, you know, if Dragon Age 4 or Dreadwolf is a hit, it's all going to be fine. What's the topic, K-Town? We are checking out just some Mass Effect content. We checked out Big Dan's review of uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, and now we checked out Kala's video on uh, Humanoid Origin, which is the studio that Casey Hudson started. Um, Crystal T, maybe it's just me, but Anthem didn't really grab me. It left me feeling meh. Yeah, so I liked some parts of Anthem. The 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 control of the uh, the various suits is fun. That like the all three of them are pretty, no, or all four of them, sorry, are, are are pretty fun to control. It's you literally feel like Iron Man, but like the 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 gameplay format is pretty repetitive. Uh, it's still relatively buggy, um, <laughs> even when I try to play it. Again, the story is not something that's very interesting characters not very interesting either and so it's like oh okay they they really didn't score the the the, the categories they should have that was necessary uh scorecraft do you think that we will be able to continue our romances from mass Effect 3 i mean obviously if but that means also you know shepherd needs to come back in order for that to happen otherwise i'd know Otherwise, we're just going to start with a new character, uh, new romantic options, for sure. Uh, people go through high school before a game is made. That's too long. Unfortunately, that's probably the future we're going to have to uh, sort of look forward to, at least for a while. Uh, I hate to say it, but I just, you know, I think that's something we're going to have to get used to at this point. Um... The new and we're gonna watch one more video. Uh, we're gonna have this is a react stream now. <laughs> These lives are usually react streams because you know it's fun, we have something to do. Um, bottom line, Bioware isn't making EA any money right now. Hard to continue support for Hopium, yeah. They are making money, but on a very um, what do you call it? They're, they're making money sort of like whenever I don't do a YouTube video, <laughs> you know, they, they make, um, they make royalty revenue, I guess, or something like that. It, you know, they still make money from some of the games that people buy, but it's not at all as much as, you know, when you release a full game. Uh, games are more complicated to make than movies. Yes. Unfortunately, today that is the case. Uh, let's see, N7 Agent. We have one more video from Kala. 
she wanted me to look at this one, so we're going to look at this one. <laughs> Let's go. During last year's N7 day, there was something that stood out amongst all the reveals, and I think it could be a clue. So let's cover my N7 agent theory, starting with the first mention of agents on the Mass Effect Twitter back in 2022. For 2022's N7 day, we were given this relay teaser clip that had to be decoded. It's a doomsday weapon. To hear the scrambled audio, and this is the first time the fan base is referred to as agents. Any other time the Mass Effect Twitter or devs have referred to the fan base, they've referred to us as Commander or Pathfinder or Spectre, never Agent, until this tweet that required some detective work. And then yesterday, the Bioware Gear Store posted a tweet highlighting Spectre Agent. And in the past, it's also just been Spectre. And no title That's has an been interesting highlighted catch. like this either. So this feels a little intentional. Yes. But why is why was the shirt? Why did it have a black stripe? That's new to me. I haven't seen that one yet. Damn. Interesting. That's new. <clears throat> and yes, I am overthinking this, but it feels important. And yes, specters are agents, but they're not referred to that in game. They're just a type of agent, but agent isn't in their title. So, my theory us. is that N7 Agent will be some kind of new faction or new division within the Spectre program, and they're called N7 Agents, and this N7 character from the clip last year and the poster is our new protagonist, a new N7 Spectre Agent. Not only does this outfit lean into a more stealth vibe, but they also have what looks like a silencer on their gun and their visor completely obscures and hides their eyes. I wonder if it's going to be like Blade Runner. Imagine a story where we like hunt after some type of uh, faction or characters that need to be hunted down because otherwise they're too dangerous for the galaxy. Like imagine if that is the case, because I get a lot of Blade Runner vibes from this. Uh, that could be so cool. Imagine a Mass Effect game, but it's like a Blade Runner type sort of... Uh, story maybe it's to locate geth and kill them <laughs> but you decide to help them instead that would be amazing every inch of skin and identity is completely covered which wasn't the case with the traditional n7 armor and again you could argue that this is simply because they haven't revealed anything about who this is and yes i agree you could argue that but why the silencer why even have them turn around pew, pew. if you're going to hide their eyes anyways? It feels more intentional. This clip feels like it was conveying a mood hey, and Tommy. a setting for the next game. And I think that setting is that this is our new N7 agent protagonist. And uh, the Blade Runner game would be a great as a spinoff. Yeah, it could really work as a spinoff for sure. But imagine like it having like a sort of element to it where, where maybe it starts out that way that, oh, you're hunting at for a certain character or something and it you know evolves into something bigger into a like a galaxy spanning adventure that could also work <laughs> how's the live going it's going pretty well it's fun just chatting chatting with you guys and just watching and reacting to stuff <laughs> as the n7 agent we are infiltrating or will be more involved in espionage or something smaller scale yes please. that requires less bluntness than shepherd or even Ryder had and I think they're showing this to us with the N7 Day teases. Each N7 Day has slowly been increasing in its detective work needed by the fandom. And you could argue that it's just a way to make the fans engage with the reveals. Oh, you're talking about like a meta way to make us involved into the whole story. Yeah, it could be like they're trying to build this big mystery in order to make us take on this you know, feeling this role of actually being agents. And then when we finally do play the game, we're actually going to play as agents. So it's like meta storytelling. I like that idea. <laughs> but I'd argue that this could be teasing us into a clue about Mass Effect 5. N7 Day 2021 had the Mass Effect Will Continue poster, which is still being analyzed to this day. We have a poster with intentionally obscured artifacts scattered throughout it and possible hidden textures. So 
I was supposed to send that to you, by the way, Cal. I was supposed to send the. I'm right. I I I will try to remember today to do it. I was supposed to do that last stream, uh, but I'll send you the mark like marked uh, quarians. So this was the first introduction of something that fans were given to analyze and think on. And then in 2022, they stepped it up and gave us an audio clip to decode. And this that was year was huge. the first time the fan base has been referred to as an agent. Everything released this year was intended to be broken down, and the fan base had a ton of fun decoding that audio, which led to a big reveal. And with last year's N7 Day, we saw this again ramped up. And not only did we have to decode three different messages, which was very fun, we had to investigate the N7 photo and break down everything in the actual clip. Also very fun. And this interactive detective work went on for hours. They released several things over the course of several hours, which kept the fans engaged, but it also made them do some heavy digging into all the teasers. And all these teasers allude to some kind of encryption and message interception and codes that need to be unlocked. All of these aspects point to a more of an espionage aspect and emphasize on detective-like work. And the codes themselves tell a story of infiltration, of someone hacking a system. And then we see the N7, who very much looks discreet and elusive. And yes, you could argue, how could an N7 who clearly wears the branding be any type of spy? And I'm not True. really saying they're a spy, but I do think if you look at the context, of all the teasers and the way they've been teased, it points to a more investigative agent type of character and story versus what we have known previously from Commander Shepard and Ryder. Yeah, it's probably not some form of assassin because you probably wouldn't wear the N7 if you're an assassin or if you're trying to hide your identity because everybody would know that you're an N7. But <clears throat> what it could be, yes, is some sort of agent that uh, still, you know, is still like an investigator. And so people know it when they see this person walking around, they're like, oh, it's an N7. And they look a little sneaky. So that's probably an investigator that's looking up like clues and stuff, sort of like a, a special police force. I could see that being a thing here. It's not so much about them being super hidden uh, because if they're ever detected anyway, it doesn't matter. This N7 from last year also has more of a duster jacket that we've never seen from a military operative or shepherd. This jacket is more sleek and smaller in frame. This entire outfit itself leans more towards something that requires movement and speed versus the previous N7 armor, which is heavier and larger. This character looks like they're trying to be discreet, and while they may be an N7 still, they give the impression that they're more used to being in the underworld, sketchier places of the galaxy, which have kind of been reflected in the concept art. Yes. Additionally, from this N7 poster, we see the Paragon symbol in renegade colors. And I think a smaller espionage right. story that leans into morality could be a really good direction for Mass Effect 5 to go. A smaller scale story that lets you define the morality of your character in a setting that allows you to both be good and altruistic or bad and morally corrupt. I think this is hinting towards the Paragon Renegade system returning. I hope and so. And I think a character like this would be the perfect way to reintroduce it. The way that- I need the Renegade Paragon system back because it really was what made it feel very different but depending on what you did. Uh, if we look at like a Mass Effect and draw, but a lot of the dialogue choices just felt so tame like everything felt so meh whenever you chose something but here you know when it comes to paragon renegade you could also always just tell like what type of response you're going to get from shepherd when you do this and what type of result you're going to get from it and so yeah i i want it back i need it back i need it back did i see mass effect 5 is that i think this will be a soft reboot into the franchise yes i think this could be setting up a new trilogy and a new character to reintroduce us into the world. And I think a smaller scale story that brings us to the depths of Ilium or Omega would be the perfect reintroduction back into Mass Effect. Of course, there would be some kind of larger threat because Mass Effect threats have always been wide scale, but like Mass Effect 1, a smaller scale threat as a re-entry into the franchise after having Shepard save the entire galaxy 
seems much safer to do. Not only would it help establish where the franchise has been, but also where it's heading. And yeah, so jumping in a, into like a galaxy-wide threat right away could be uh, could be a little jarring for people who like maybe get introduced to Mass Effect, and so right before the game releases or just when it releases, maybe we have a lot of newcomers that have played through the trilogy because that's usually what happens when people when new games come out, right? When follow up follow up sequels and stuff come out, a lot of people go back and play the old games, and newcomers play the old games. And so we already like had this giant galactic war. So maybe a better way to reintroduce people to the galaxy would be through a smaller scale threat that they could then build up to something bigger, maybe in the second game that comes after or something like that. Yes, possibly a trilogy because they need to start off with something small that lets people kind of land into the universe again without feeling like, oh, wait, what? Another one? <laughs> And on top of this, it would be a good way to set up future games, especially if this is some kind of trilogy or duology with any type of sequel. Mass Effect 1 was a smaller scale story. It wasn't until 3 that you really feel the galaxy wide scale threat of the Reapers. But the previous games had smaller, more isolated stories True. that were more focused on world building and character building. And this is what I hope to see from Mass Effect 5. It's been, as of right now, 12 years since Mass Effect 3, and 7 since Mass Effect Andromeda. And Mass Effect 5 isn't coming out for a while. So even more time will have passed, and it's going to be necessary for them to reintroduce the world to both returning players and new players, which will be the largest demographic that Mass Effect 5 will be marketed towards, because that's just how gaming works. And setting up a smaller story with something like the original intent from Mass Effect 1 would be perfect, focusing on a smaller scale Jack Bauer-like story who is a federal agent would not only bring back Mass Effect to its roots, but it could also put a new but similar spin on the context of the world that we already know. And we've already seen several hints towards this game referencing Project SFX, which was Mass Effect's project name before it became known as Mass Effect. We've seen references to Epsilon and Oculon, both previous possible names for Mass Effect 1. Yeah. So I do think they're hinting at a return to Mass Effect's roots. And I think a story inspired the foundation that Mass Effect was founded on, on which was originally about a Jack Bauer type character, could be really popular if Shepard doesn't return. True. I would almost say like, um. Maybe not a Jack Bauer in space this time, but more like a James Bond. This seems more like a James Bond kind of situation. I like that. I think the Reaper threat was well executed in the Mass Effect. Absolutely. One of the best type of villains ever. They're, they're so cool. I'm indoctrinated. Because I think at this point, I feel like I've kind of accepted that Shepard will not be returning. Not because I don't want them to, but because I think making them return would not be able to honor a lot of people's endings and choices. True. Which I think really goes against the Bioware formula. I think it's just too complicated to bring Shepard back, unless you do a smaller scale way, and that is only in playthroughs of people who chose the perfect destroy as their endings. True. But I don't think the people who prefer synthesis or control, or even reject, should have to have any endings forced on them. It also ruins replayability of the Legendary Edition, True. which was Bioware's most successful title. And let's be real, I don't think we'll ever get another character that is a commander if it isn't Shepard, because Commander Shepard is too iconic and too intrinsic to Shepard. True. We will get a new character with a new title, and I think that title could be Agent. So I think this is a new N7, I think this is a new character, and I think this is a new introduction into what Mass Effect is going to look like in the future. It's the most logical answer. And I also think introducing a smaller scale story allows them to shape and mold the future. The future of Bioware is kind of uncertain right now. And I wonder if they're even planning this game to have future sequels as of right now. Game development takes a long time and the industry is very unknown right now in regards to the future of studios and job stability. It's James so, Vega. A smaller scale story that they. He stopped lifting. <laughs> can isolate in one game 
with the potential to make sequels seems like a smart financial move as well. So I think that once Dreadwolf releases, Bioware will go full force with its N7 days mm -hmm. and its general focus on Mass Effect. We've already seen Destiny collaborations recently and upcoming right. board games, as well as an uptick in merchandise. And I expect whatever N7 day is after Dreadwolf's release will lean even more heavily into the detective interactive clue finding experience from the last few years. Unless the uh, Michael and the team backs off because of the the little backlash they got on this N7 day, because there were actually quite a number of people that didn't like the small teasers throughout the day. I loved it. I, I liked it a lot. I'm always super excited for it. But yeah, there were definitely people who were not super happy and kind of called out both Michael and Bioware. But, you know, I, I hope they do, like that doesn't discourage them because it is super fun, especially for super fans to go through because we know what the situation is like, right? We know that it's going to take time. We know that they're still in pre-production. So it's like, it's just fun. Um, but like, I still get it, you know? You want to see more and people want to see actual gameplay and stuff, but still, it's way too early. This last N7 day was awesome. It was fun to stream and to talk about stuff as it was revealed in real time. And I hope they continue doing that, but hopefully with some more concrete reveals in the future. So here's my theory about this being an N7 agent and the future of Mass Effect 5 and its smaller scale spy thriller espionage Jack Bauer story possibility. Let me know what you think in the comments and if you'd like if Mass Effect 5 went this direction. Thank you for watching and see you next time. I think it could work. It could probably, uh, you know, especially as a new character, right? Because you also are reaching a new audience. So it could definitely work. Uh, I don't have anything against it. I, I could I could definitely see that happening. And also like a small, smaller scale story. Um, again, I think it's important that they try not to overdo it with the galactic threats. I think that could work down the line, like in the, maybe the second game or the third game again. But when it comes to the first game, I think they got to softly like introduce you again. And so a smaller story with a lot of more investigative elements that maybe like blooms into something bigger later on, like we saw in Mass Effect 1, that could work as well. But we don't want it to go like, we don't want it to just sort of uh, copy what Mass Effect 1 did as well. And so we have another threat that's like an AI that's <laughs> coming back to haunt the galaxy again. Like it has to be something different. It has to be something different. Uh, time travel benefactors, the N7 gets sent back in time. You play their story working behind the sense, the scenes to get resources for the arcs. You're the team from a distance. Hmm. That's a big one. Adam Jensen is under that helm. He also slimmed down a bit, I see. End of the first game could tease a the big threat. Very true. Uh, that is usually how it's it's handled, right? And yeah, that's that's the most reasonable way to do it. Uh, but when it comes to Mass Effect, yeah, I, I, I definitely think smaller scale could probably work. But I think I would I would really like to see like either dark dark energy or galactic civil war. Either of those two, or both of them, like combined in some weird way. I could see that happening too. The Leviathans, yeah, sure. Leviathans too, but uh, I wouldn't want them back as villains because after like making peace with them in Mass Effect 3, it just, it would feel strange. It's it's like fighting the Geth again, right? Um, it would just feel better to not fight them again because we've already fought them and then we of course the leviathans they just they just don't seem like a like a hostile species sure they're arrogant but uh they supposedly weren't like a hostile conqueror race uh, they were of course mind controlling people and other species and like acting like gods but that's just because they thought they were like oh we're gods but they seem to in a strange way, like care about their subject races, which is why they started, like why they created the catalyst in the first place to like fix this problem of them always killing themselves. Um, 
so yeah leviathan it just is does not seem to be the best sort of villain for me in my opinion uh gives a new character make evil god shepherd control ending cannon damn and Leviathan earned from, uh, learned from their star child mistake. I would hope so. Otherwise, they would be some very dumb, dumb villains. Uh, which they, you know, kind of already were, but can't really call them villains, though. Uh, Leviathans can very much be behind the Galactic Civil War. Like, when you think of the capabilities, right? Yeah, of course they could. Of course, you know, with how they work. How they control people from a distance um and that they want to be worshipped as gods and now the reapers are gone so i mean they could but it doesn't seem to fit what their motivations were um unless they go a different direction you know <laughs> and decide that hey okay so leviathans could still like try to grab power but I don't know. It just feels strange with what happened in 3. Or EA goes safe again and ME5 is a prequel. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, no. It's not a prequel. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no. Besides, we've already seen Liara, right? And we've already seen, like, things that uh, hint towards a future, not a prequel. Uh, but then again, maybe that's just, uh, you know, uh, one of those things where they're trying to fool us and throw us off and this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> And so they, they, they do the first contact war and we're just not ready for it. I can see Leviathans be a side villain, maybe a DLC once again. I don't know. I would like them to just come back, but like an interactable alien that you can maybe like talk to. Maybe you see a big Leviathan like walking around in the water uh, on the Citadel, <laughs> taking a bath or something. And you can like engage with them and say, hey, what's up? How, how you doing? And they're like, do you mind? I'm taking a bath. Like something like that would just be interesting. Uh, just interacting with them in a silly way or just, you know, maybe not in a silly way because that would kind of lessen their uh, their characters, really. Uh, we don't want to make them joke characters, but just, you know, they're just big species. A like Krogan wanting to buy a Leviathan. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe some 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 flippant thing like that. <laughs> Uh, Leviathans could have learned from their mistakes and still isolate themselves in the system. Maybe they still enthralled some beings, but not to be a danger to anyone. That would still probably I th happen, I think. The Leviathans would probably need to enthrall people because they can't, they don't have hands. So they can't like grab stuff and build stuff. They need other, other species to do that for them. Because we saw that as well in the Leviathan DLC that they literally can just mind control people and then the thralls do everything for them. Um... And it seems like they're 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 directly controlling the thralls, but they can't do anything with their with their big legs. Um, Leviathan bath on the Citadel can't get that image out of my head right now. I mean, it, I don't know. I'm just I'm just sillying around, but some sort of interaction with them could be cool, where they're not actually hostile towards you. I I don't know why. I just feel like ah, I want to see something like that this time around. I like when like anti-heroes, villains, I like when they sort of turn around and they become like not a direct threat anymore. And so you just like, oh, OK, I can interact with this with this character. I, I, I just like that sometimes. Just joined. What did I miss? Well, a bunch of stuff, I guess. We we talked a lot about uh, Mass Wind Andromeda. Watched Dan's video. Checked out Callus. Two videos. One about Humanoid Origins, which is Casey Hudson's new studio, uh, and uh, her last N Seven Day or N Seven Agent uh, video. Uh, Leviathans are invited to the council. <laughs> Imagine seeing a big Leviathan sitting on the council. Jesus. Um, Raw Max. Maybe Liara is working on something with the Geth and a team that the Council doesn't like, which includes Dark Energy and the N7 agent has to hunt her team down. She is still the Shadow Broker. That's possible. Yeah, that could be a thing because 
that is essentially it's the, well the last no 2022s and 70s are definitely pointed to something like that where something's going on with humanity so it's you know maybe it's the council again would not be the silliest thing that the council did true Leviathan came out of the water on the Citadel, and the Krogan says, See, I told you there was a fish in the lake. <laughs> Technically, they're squid, right? Um, first Leviathan Spectre, Shepard's new team member. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, as, as much as I would like to see that happen, that wouldn't happen. Could you pet your kitty? I could. Let's see if I can bring her over. She's going to be really mad at me for doing this. But you guys can't see her otherwise. Ah, she's like the whiniest cat ever. You can't really grab her. She goes nuts. Or well, she's very nice, but she whines. Oh, d d yawn. She's tired. Kitty, Yoshi might. Yos Yosemite. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. I wanted you to check on something, but I asked too much. Feel bad. Say what? Let me know. What did I need to check? An infant leviathan is a temporary comparison and a companion in an underwater mission. Oh, cute. Yes. Could sh could have the Krogan grow too big as a civilization and be antagonized. Yeah, that could work as well because the Krogan do, like, they reproduce way too quickly. Especially now that we can assume that the... Uh, the, the genophage is gone. But you know, you never know. Time to shut out all communications with the council again? Yes. So Discord member decrypted Geth audio from the relay recording. Or kind of did. I'll have to check that out later. Uh, after using the catalyst weapon, no good deeds go, goes unpunished. Yes, the Reapers are gone, but if what if something far worse that has been waiting in dark space? Their goal is utter destruction. I think that's a little bit unoriginal. I think they're probably going to go with something like, oh, it's, it's, if they're going to go with like a, a, an alien threat, it's probably going to be either from the Andromeda galaxy, uh, and we're going to see like a continuation sort of the Andromeda storyline, or we're going to see something with, uh, the Relay 314, like maybe that's getting opened and we get a new species introduced to the galaxy, but they're not very nice. That could also happen. Uh, I think that one really interesting thing would be to make a civil war kind of story where you clean up all the shepherds, all shepherd decisions. Yes. Because we want to see what happens after all our choices in the trilogy. And seeing all those choices, you know, and you have having to deal with it as a new character, it could be really cool. I could see that happening. I, I would have liked that because then you would feel a connection to the trilogy still, and it still sort of has to do with the story of the trilogy. And yeah. I want the Rachni to be an ally. Yeah. Th they're also an enemy I would prefer not to fight against again. War against sentient stars? <laughs> I don't know how you could fight that. Uh, I just wish that Star Child never happened. Life would, would have been so much easier. For sure, Karn. <laughs> Mars Attacks 3. Uh, the next villain are the Guardians. What, what are the Guardians? Are you talking about... Oh no, don't tell me Destiny. What, one more story? Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts on them just doing a new person and not Shepard? I'm fine with that. That's probably the most reasonable choice to go with. Uh, again, for the thousandth time, I I I, I can see Shepard coming back as well. But it's yeah, it's more of a stretch, and you have to kind of write write a specific story for that to kind of happen. I see it as. Uh, do you think synthesis control ending could be a really good starting point or multiverse where all endings are canon? I would rather destroy ending. Uh, yeah, so that's why I think they're probably going to set it further into the future because that is the only way I can think of where you don't have to deal with the immediate consequences of Shepard's actions. 
So you can still have synthesis, you can still have control, you can still have destroy, but all of them resulting is sort of in the same thing anyway. Like the Reapers leave, the Reapers or the, the Shepherd uh, AI leaves because of reasons. And so, you know, you can just put it further into the future. And so you're seeing a galaxy that has been rebuilt and you're going to deal with some of the consequences of Shepard's actions, not all of them. Synthesis imp is impossible to continue. I don't know if it is, but it's it seems to be impossible to continue because I can't imagine why you would start a war with another species if you have full understanding of them and as far as we can understand synthesis really like the relays exploding really did affect all of the galaxy and so every life form in the galaxy is now a half synthetic being meaning that they have full contact with every other uh you know with every other life form in the galaxy so and you wouldn't have a cyclical, you know, AI versus organic war anymore because we would all be the same. <laughs> so what do you do when basically everything is like the same, when everybody is essentially the same type of life form? Um... Extra galactic threat. Yes, that could work. So something that comes from outside the galaxy, and I would like guess the Andromeda galaxy could probably work, you know, something from there. Good afternoon, Mystic. How you doing? Welcome. Playing a non-human would be awesome, but that would impact the voice acting for the MC. Yeah, that's hard to imagine. I don't think it's impossible to like have several species but it's just not as um likely as in like dragon age because in games like that because those games have generally human characters that you can choose between like human races sort of but mass effect is so very different races so it would only really work i think for asarian humans um <clears throat> elderly wheelchair bound shepherd wanting to join the mission to save the galaxy <laughs> er, get me my rifle i can see the leviathan as a side story but main story would be cerberus it's an idea that doesn't die cerberus could continue very easily i think yes it's very much an ideal or an or an idea yes Maybe we're unified no matter what, and the story is so far th into the future, we've already reached synthesis naturally, regardless of ending choice. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what the unified thing they're going with, uh, you know, as well. Could also work. Think uh, I think making a canon, a game where one ending is canon is the best, and it makes sense for the most of its to be destroyed. Yeah, I mean, if the the simplest way is really to do that. It is the easiest way and to like settle on certain canonic choices, but unfortunately it excludes a lot of people from, from their playthroughs. So I don't know. I'm not alone to see Shepard in a wheelchair. <laughs> I'm great. I'm great too, Mystic. Yosemite, yes. She is washing all over. Um, it comes back and now rules the galaxy with an iron fist. I would be happy to see that. I I uh I love Edie. So Edie supremacy all day, every day. Perfect destroy is kind of for me since you really need to do everything to unlock it. Yes, it is the hardest ending to get. So in a way, yes. How would the Andromeda crew react to returning to Milky Way if everyone had undergone synthesis? Do you think there would be a potential conflict there? Possibly. Yeah. I would be interested to see <laughs> in seeing 
a synthesis um a synthesis future encountering the Ket from Andromeda because they were trying to reach this ascendance through organic means alone but what if like they meet the synthesis people of the Milky Way galaxy that have now reached like the highest form of living as th that you can I wonder what the cat would think <laughs> I wonder what the sort of conflict would be since this is, is an option I want to see Edie and Joker child Jesus <laughs> I can't wrap my head around that because it just does not make sense <laughs> it just doesn't it's it's literally space magic <laughs> see that's the thing right i always thought when when mass Effect 3 released and i saw the synthesis end in 2 i was like oh so it's got to be the perfect ending but it's just it's so unreasonable it does not make sense how do you how do you make a synthetic thing suddenly have new dna in its body when it didn't have dna in the first place it's like wait <laughs> how does that work did dna just magically appear in their bodies <laughs> in their units so like a geth that's literally mostly just a hunk of walking metal they now have cells <laughs> What have I come back to? We're discussing synthesis and how it does not make sense. Um, just shade their eyes green. Yes, <laughs> loaned organs. I don't know. Can you guys make sense of synthesis? I literally, I've thought about it for so many years and I can't. I just can't. You know, what? Uh, too many gray names? Uh, do you think so? I don't think there's there's mostly green names I think uh synthesis worst ending 100 percent I wouldn't say that it's the worst but it, it is a strange ending it is my third liked ending I think first of uh, first is control then is con uh, then is destroy um then is synthesis of course refusal is just downright bad there's nothing good that comes out of refusal because everybody dies wait synthesis means the asari can mate with a robot now yes everybody can fuck <laughs> but it doesn't make sense uh synthesis is like happy ending no conflict everyone understands each other organic and synthetic and everyone is happy kind of feels off they're all strange endings? Yes, Kala. <laughs> you take the high road. <laughs> or what What do you call it when somebody, like, sits above? <laughs> Choose not to take sides. <laughs> no, but seriously, like, I like synthesis sort of as an idea. I just I just need to understand it, you know, as but because it just doesn't make sense. But I agree, they, they are silly endings, all of them. Elias coming in here and just gifting. I don't even know how many here. Uh, Jesus. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Elias, thank you. Appreciate it, my man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Gonna add you up here. Elias Vernieri. You absolute specter, you. W's for Elias, guys. Look at this guy. Boom. Jesus. I don't really know what to say here. I don't know what to do with my alerts because if I turn this on right now, it's going to play two alerts in a row and I don't know how to turn that off. I think it's up now. Where is it? Is it not working? There it is. So let's see. Okay, look at this. So we have Garrus dancing here, right? The problem is that he dances twice per member 
and I don't know what to do about that. Um, again, less. Thank you. Absolute boss. Uh, there's something I want to say about Kala's video. I know people choose their endings, but I don't think synthesis or control will be a thing in ME5, where you canonize or you do a totally different thing. Again, it's probably easier. It's definitely easier if they would just go with one ending. But the problem is, you know, oh, Jesus, what what do you do? You know, why is your cat spinning? She is spinning. She's good at doing the things when I'm not looking. I don't know. She just does things. Hey. 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 There you are. Yes. Look at the camera. Look at the camera. Look at her. Look at her. Yosemite. I don't know why uh, her... Uh, um, why why she's named Yoshimite. Yoshimite. Right, no, it was because their names started with, an, with a Y. Because the boy, our boy cat, her sibling, her brother, his name is Yoda. So, yeah. I don't know why I had to say that. It's like a f fluffy Siamese. It's a ragdoll for you all, all of you Americans over there. This is a ragdoll cat. Yes, we have an American, we have American cats and a Japanese dog. That's how we do it here in Sweden. We just t take from other cultures. <laughs> um, right, the breeder did the Y for them, so we never changed their names. Uh, what if your cat becomes your background character in the next game? I would love that. Imagine having a Shiba Inu or a ragdoll cat on the Normandy. That would be amazing. Chris Bill, how you doing? Welcome. Should have named your cat Conrad. You mean Yoda? Yeah, he could. We could. We could have named him Conrad, but he wouldn't have listened because he actually kind of listens to Yoda. Um. Yeah, they are the best, but she's a, she's a strange ragdoll because she doesn't really act like a ragdoll. She acts just, uh, she's just a squeamish, squeamish cat. You can't pick her up because she just goes, what? <laughs> she doesn't bite or claw or anything, but she just, you know, starts whining. Right, that's you. Yes, I was pretending to be you. Uh, sorry, I lost the chat. Where are we? Um, synthesis would be good, but it has no explanation in the story at all. It is out of nowhere. Right. So my problem with synthesis, right, is that it, I can't make sense or heads, of ta heads or tails of what it means. Um, because you start thinking, okay, but how does it work? Right. So we have things like element zero. Element zero is I think a well explained element in the game. So you charge it with a, with an electrical current, either a negative current or a positive current, and you decrease and you increase mass. And it makes sense, right? In a scientific or like a science fiction kind of way, it does make sense. And there are other elements that make sense as well in massive, but synthesis is the one thing where I'm like, that does not make logical sense at all. Nano machine infusion. Yes, that makes sense if that is how they choose to explain it. I could see nano machine infusion somewhat being a reason for how synthesis actually works. Uh, that it's just small, small machines that. I don't know, have an infusion or of organic material or that it it produces organic material somehow. I don't know. Like, it's still, what are you doing? Oh, okay. She's just playing with her tail. Um, 
Control ending doesn't leave much room for sequels because every conflict can be concluded with the Reapers blowing up the bad guys. True, yeah, they're like a police force. I've talked about that before again. But I could also see it working because all you need to do is just write that Shepard realizes this is a problem and does not want to suppress freedom throughout the galaxy and so just takes off with the Reapers. That's how you kind of write them out of the story. You know, you could still go with control, but Shepard going like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm kind of like an overlord now. I don't want to be that, so I'm just going to fuck right off. <laughs> I think that could work. That's an easy way of explaining that away. But synthesis, and then you have like the Reapers being like these guardians that share the knowledge of everything that's happened before, and they're now living. And yes, it is a good ending when you, when you really think about it, but I don't know. I can see why tiny nanomites helping, healing people medically. Yeah. Like, it could be a really interesting story to go through. Like, let's say that they decided on synthesis, right? It could be a really interesting thing to go with to build a, star, a story off of. I, I just can't imagine how. Um. So the mass release produced nanobots then? Yeah, supposedly. That seems to be the case. Nanobots that just flies out at the speed of light or for, like much faster than the speed of light and just crosses throughout the galaxy and everybody gets affected. Um, oh, copies. Lunch break over. Happy I was able to catch some of that stream today. Have a good day, night. Have a good lunch, man. Or, well, no. Have a good day at work. Sorry. <laughs> um, saw a documentary that say at the atomic scale the difference between machines and organics disappear yeah i mean when you really think about it that's true it definitely does but that is at the atomic scale <laughs> by then you know but then you know dna is not really at the atomic scale is it it's it's bigger so because dna are made out of uh certain chains of of uh, of uh, atoms and different materials so yeah it's still not really there as uh, synthesis could be a real conflict killer though in my opinion yes that is essentially my problem my biggest problem with synthesis it's it's that it's it cures most conflicts really because why would you fight if all everyone in the galaxy understands each other perfectly uh, <laughs> especially with that also with that uh, with that uh, concept art by Matt Rhodes where he like uh, where you can see like an Asari in the future and they had ad adapted to traveling between like between relays and stuff with their bodies and so you're like, oh, okay, so there's really no need for, you know, fighting or anything because everybody has evolved past that point to where basically everyone is sort of like a small god. So it's like, oh, okay, what, how do you build from that? Uh, Saint with the 11 months, thank you for the support, man. Hello, hello, welcome. Proteins, nucleic acids. Yes. Really would like to see a mass relay from inside. I mean, there are lots of windows that must have and inside that could be cool to see imagine standing night right next to it going like whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, how do you think a control landing would develop on me5 i've made theory videos on this before it would essentially go in the way of shepherd um being a police force after the ending of three being like a guardian but because of this you know massive power that the shepherd ai now has Shepard essentially just decides to leave because he or she is literally suppressing other stars and their freedom, uh, essentially just to keep the order. And so to allow freedom, but also chaos, uh, Shepard leaves with the Reapers. And that's how the story starts. And in my imagination, I would like to see that happen because then you could actually have a search for Shepard or the Shepard AI because you're like, oh, okay, we have a threat that's coming to the galaxy, uh, or we have something that's really rising and we need Shepard back, we need the Shepard Reapers, we need the, we need the Shepard AI, we need Shepard back. 
how do we do this without them? We can't, we need to find them. And then it's like a race against time to find the Reapers again that can save the galaxy this time around. Uh, that could be cool. I would like a story like that because that means that, okay, we, you know, we're turning the, the whole villain thing on its head. I like stories like that. Bond, welcome, man. Uh, do finding each other, but might be a few faction groups that are against Femshek and the Alliance. Yeah, so that was like the entire idea behind the uh, Galactic Civil War thing, but I think it's more reasonable to imagine that large portions of the different races of the galaxy start fighting because when one race essentially has the technological advantage and i'm thinking more about like reaper parts i've talked about that before you're naturally gonna start like having animosities between each other because one race is now slightly or even much more powerful than the other. I feel like control ending is such an anti-shepherd thing to do. It, it is, kind of, in a way. But he or she also said the elusive, the elusive man was right. Right? Shepard did say that. So, but if they run to the void, how do you catch them? The Reapers? Well, then they're just resting in dark space and you just retrieve them somehow with a very fast ship. <laughs> uh, I think we'll be about dark energy about what the Geth are doing. I hope so. I would love to see that. Kala would too. I know that she would. Don't want to see the Reapers again personally. That's fine, Kala. But what if it's a good guy Reaper? I would like to hear a female voice from a Reaper, you know? At one point, I want to hear that. That would be cool. Imagine hearing that. We would have heard that if they kept to the original idea for Mass Effect 3 for the main story ending, because then it wasn't supposed to be the catalyst. We were actually supposed to uh, meet the Reaper Queen. And yes, you can quote me on that. Go check out uh, Dan's video on this. He talks about it in a video. The Reapers originally had a queen in the story. And, uh, yeah, that would have been interesting. Famship Reaper voice, right? I forgot. Yes, that's true. You actually hear a female Reaper voice with Shepard if you choose the control ending. That's true. You do get that, though. A Reaper Queen? I want to know more. Yeah, go check out uh, Dan's video. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. Wait. Um. Do, 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 do. Wait a moment. Iceberg theories, I think. Uh, will the Thorian return? Blah, blah, blah. Major changes to Mass Effect 3. I think hey, this in December is 20 it. Major plot changes. Kai Lang. I think it was a, a Big Dan video, really. Because there was talk of a Reaper Queen. There was some form of concept art. I can't find the video that Dan made though, but I know it was a thing.
Oh, I'm upset. Alright. Early concept art ending encounter. I think this is it. Okay, so here we go, I think. Yes. There we go. So that is supposedly the Reaper Queen. This is concept art for what it was. <clears throat> so in case you didn't know that was a thing, it was a thing. So, uh, yeah, that didn't happen. Uh, I, I would have imagined that would have been pretty cool. I, it would probably have been... But then again, you know, there's some emotion, really emotional uh, impact when, you know... Or maybe this is after... This is probably after Anderson and uh, the Elusive Man. But it, this would have probably been it if not for the Star Child. It would have been like this. Right. So, um, yeah. That would have been very interesting. I thought it was yours. I think it was... Uh, yeah, but the de deleted ending. Yeah, Big Dan. Mr. Olton, NPC at the bar hitting on the sorry. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Uh, only Reaper Queen was mentioned as far as I know, but there isn't any Leviathan. No, Reaper Queen. Not, not a Leviathan one. Uh, oh, I'm happy the Reaper Queen didn't happen. Looks really bad. <laughs> yeah, it looked kind of odd. I think making a nice Reaper becomes too similar to the dark energy the Reapers were actually trying to help the galaxy type of situation. Maybe, maybe. But if it's controlled by Shepard, it's another thing. It's another thing. Um, oh man, I would have liked that. Instead, we had a boring and annoying child. I actually... I, I would personally have been more interested in seeing a Reaper Queen, but I, I, in all honesty, I would have liked to see just Harbinger. I really, I really do think that they, they, they should have just kept Harbinger as a, like the main bad guy. Yes, you can talk to him. Yes, you can have this long ass dialogue with him, sort of like what you have with the Star Child. But did you, that you actually come to an understanding with this nemesis you've been fighting against for several, like for two games now. The Har Harbinger should have had the main role as the main villain. Maybe he has like a smaller body that you engage with, like when you're uh, in the Citadel, you know, when you're talking to him. Maybe, you know, it's a hologram like it was with the, with the Star Child, but still it's like it's the first Reaper. And hearing Harbinger speak, it would be like, oh, hearing the original Leviathans speaking on what happened because he was created out of all the Leviathans. It would have, I think it would have had more resonance, especially with the idea that we then got the Leviathan DLC. That would have fit so much better seeing Harbinger actually being not just a Reaper, but the actual architect of all of it, right? I would have liked, yes, and then maybe possibly having a standoff against Harbinger. Yes, that could have been really cool. Something, something like that. It, it felt more personal with Harbinger, but then the Star Child is like, oh, okay, you're just a god and you're just, uh, I guess, okay. Um, Yeah, Harbinger would have been sick, I actually like that way better. Yes, very much. I, I would have loved to see Harbinger. I think it was a missed, cho a missed opportunity not to have him. Uh, in some way, you know, and still have a dialogue. I would have liked to talk to Harbinger because we already got two other times where we talked to a Reaper, and it's both of those times are fucking awesome. It's 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 uh, Sovereign and then the Reaper on Rannoch, and uh, of course Harbinger in Mass Effect Two. But then having that with more Harbinger in Mass Effect Three would been would have been even even better. A Reaper's organic with the needing of a queen. Yeah, it was just supposedly like a concept idea. I don't know if it would have been a good idea at the end of the day. But yeah, uh, is there any mods for the customization for male female shepherds besides the ones you uploaded? There probably is. I just haven't tried mods for Mass Effect in so long. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, I'll probably will at some point soon. 
Got to get into modding Mass Effect again, though. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, takes time to to get into that. But I'll be off for today, guys. Thank you for checking out today's stream and thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for the memberships and for the support, guys. And thank you, Elias Vernieri, as always, you absolute boss for the gifted. Thank you. Um, if Byer takes their time to make ME5, maybe we can avoid discussing better endings in the future. Yes. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Hopefully that's the case. And thank you, Kala, for the content that you allowed me to siphon off of today. <laughs> Have a great uh, week, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Hugs and kisses. Yosemite says bye as well, but she's not reacting right now.